Well, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, again, tonight, uh, as we've done each, each uh, time so far, uh, and just to remind you, as we read along, we don't read each chapter, or tonight's case, the, the two chapters, we don't read those isolated, right? So it's good to review a little bit of the previous reading and, uh, and help us uh, see this continuity and flow uh, that Mark has for us. So we look back at chapter 6. Um, to, we see there first um, that um, Mark relays this story uh, of, of Jesus giving authority to the disciples okay, uh, to drive out demons, uh, to heal, to heal people, and that the disciples indeed go do all that. Um, he sends them out, and, and we saw too him rejected at Nazareth. He was rejected in his hometown, uh, where he wasn't you know, because of the lack of faith. He wasn't able to do. Uh, it says he was not able to do any mighty works there. So he sends the twelve out. Then we get this kind of interlude, this interesting story about John the uh, Baptist being beheaded. It's kind of a strange thing to include here. It feels like, uh, but he includes this, and we can see a little bit later. Uh, next is the kind of one of the central stories uh, for this chapter was that Jesus feeds the 5,000. You remember that you had this whole group of folks following them. Uh, the disciples say, Jesus, we need to send these folks away. They're going to be hungry. Uh, and so, so we can't keep them here. Let's, let's send them on. And Jesus says, no, you feed them. And they, of course, they, they're flabbergasted. Well, we can't do that. We don't have the reason. You know, how are we going to do that? Jesus asks them, you know, collect what you can for food, and they, they get five loaves of bread and two fish. Um, and, and as the story continues, we see that everyone, that said 5,000 men, and we assume and we work into that there's uh, women and children as well, so a whole lot of people, um, and they had everybody satisfied and 12 baskets of food left over. Okay, so an amazing, miraculous thing that Jesus does here taking care of these folks. Uh, the disciples see this, and, and finally Jesus uh, is, is finished, and he sends the, sends the disciples away, uh, puts them in a boat, and tells them to go across the, the water to the next spot, and hoping they'll get some rest. It says Jesus dismisses the crowds. He goes up to on the mountain to pray up on the hill, uh, and he sees them then as they're making their way across this body of water that it's hard, and, the, and it says the wind was against them, they're struggling, and it was, the, it was late at night, we're talking, and actually it says the fourth watch, so 3 a.m., right, so you want you to picture, it's, it's windy, it's just miserable, uh, pitch black, no doubt, I mean, I, what could they see out in the middle of this body of water, and what does Jesus do? He sees them struggling, he crosses the water, and... Just testing your memory. The disciples go, yay, Jesus is here. <laughs> no, right, exact opposite. They freak out. They think it's a ghost. Uh, and, and we have these words from Jesus. Immediately he spoke to them, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Uh, and the interesting part there, Katie touched on this in the children's message, he was going to pass by, and it takes us back to some of the Old Testament story where, Jesus, uh, where, where the Lord passed by Moses and the rock, and, 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 and so some of this tied into this Old Testament story. But he says, take heart, it is, it is I, do not be afraid. And then he hops in the boat with them. And one of the takeaways we had from that night, from, from, this, from this story as we saw this unfold, is that in the midst of the troubles, a couple things, Jesus sees us. There are times we can understand we feel much like the disciples. The wind is against us. Life is hard, but Jesus sees you and he comes to you. We talked about how in the Lord's Supper or baptism or the word, Jesus continues to make his presence known to you, right? Um, and, and that he's with you. Uh, he hops in the boat. Take heart as I do not be afraid. That, that was chapter six. So then we get to today, chapter seven. Uh, seven and eight. And starts out, he's talking about traditions and commandments. Uh, and he has a warning for people, right? He has a warning for them because they have set up some of these traditions and specifically to kind of help get around uh, some of the commandments that are there. And in particular, it's about honoring your father and mother. And they've got this deal where it's tied into inheritance and all this stuff. And Jesus says this, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it's written, the people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. In other words, the, the things we do that we've created as good and right things to do for worship, perhaps, or, or religious habits, have gained prominence and importance over what God actually says to do, to the point that they're abusing, uh, taking care of their parents. 
And it's a warning not to let that happen. And, and we're not going to spend time here, but it is, it's good for us to be thinking about that. What are some of the traditions we hold? Not that all traditions are bad. But what are some of the things that we do that maybe conflict with what God desires for us to do that he's called for us in the law? He goes on, chapter 14, we start looking at what actually defiles a person. And so some of the traditions are tied into this, right? They had rules that they had set up much earlier about what you could eat, what you could not eat. And he says to them, he's clarifying here. He says, what comes into a person can't really defile you, he says. It can't make you unclean. Okay, is what he's getting. He's talking about a spiritual condition. He says, rather, it's what comes out of you, right? And he goes on with this list. What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All of these evil things come from inside, from within, and they defile a person. So your, your sinfulness is not what you consume, he makes a note here that says he's then declaring all foods clean. It's not what we consume, but rather what comes out of us. Again, a warning. Then we have this story about the Syrophoenician woman. This is somebody that was not of the, the chosen people, so to speak, right? And uh, she's begging for her daughter to be healed. Um, and Jesus gives this odd response. It says it's not uh, the children be, that should be fed first. It's not the right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. He's calling this woman a dog. It's an awkward thing, right? And yet she continues to express this faith, and he says that your words, uh, the demon has left your daughter for this statement that you have made. Uh, she's expressing faith. She's seeing what Jesus does, and it's an odd place for it to happen. Again, an unbeliever, somebody outside of the community. Uh, next, we hear Jesus healing, we see Jesus healing a deaf man, okay? We have this, this little episode, and, and then we get to chapter 8, and we got a story that we're pretty familiar with, uh, or another story that sounds familiar from a previous one. Jesus feeds the 4,000, uh, verse 2 of chapter 8. I have, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat, and if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way, and some of them have come from far away. Now, what would you expect? We just said it was two chapters ago. Jesus says, we've got to feed these people. We're not going to send them away. What would you expect as a disciple to have happen? Let's do it, right? Sure. We just read this. We've got the hindsight kind of thing going here. But the disciples say, verse 4, his disciples answered him, how can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? Or immediately they doubt Jesus, right? And of course, Jesus says, well, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. So with seven loaves, of course, he, and he sets before them before the crowd. It says they have a few small fish. We don't have any idea. He blesses them, and he said to set those before him. And they, he says they, were, they ate and were satisfied just like before. They take up the broken pieces, and they have seven basketfuls. So again, I want you to see the pattern that we've seen that Mark is repeating to us over and over. Jesus wants to do something, either the disciples, or the Pharisees, Sadducees, whoever, the people doubt that Jesus can do what he is going to do for the most part. Uh, and of course, he, he does it in an amazing way and fulfills, what, fulfills whatever it is he has set out to do. Verse 10 ends in a transitions for us, again, with another common phrase. And immediately, we've talked about that, he's got this, this 41 times, remember, Immediately he got into the boat with his disciples, and they went to the district of uh, Dalmanutha. Now, um, verse 11, the Pharisees came, began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he says, why do they, why do they seek a sign? And it's curious to me as we think about this that they're demanding a sign. What are some of the things they have seen Jesus do already? Just think so far in Mark, what have we talked about? He's fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. He's just fed 4,000 people with seven fish or seven loaves of bread. What else has he done? He's healed the deaf man. He has uh, walked on water twice. He casts out demons, right? The pigs episode, remember? They have seen all sorts of things. And one of my questions is what, sign, what else do they need for a sign, right? And yet they still continue to ask, but he says, I'm not going to give you a sign. Um, and he left them, he got into his boat and goes on to the other side. 
Now, as the, they and the disciples are getting across, there's this interesting note in verse 14. They got, they had forgotten to bring bread. Seems like a funny thing to say in the reading. They had only one loaf of boat in, or one loaf of bread in the boat with them. So Jesus and the disciples, and there's one loaf of bread. Verse 15, he cautions them, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. So this is a, another kind of parable statement, right? The leaven was something that's going to spoil the bread, okay, for their purposes, and, and something's going to mess it up. He says, be careful of this. You don't want any of it in there, all right? Um, and verse 16, and again, Jesus is making a spiritual point, and what do they say in verse 16? They began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. Uh, you should chuckle a little bit at this point because you're just laughing at these poor guys who are not getting it. Jesus is trying to teach them something, and what are they worried about? I mean, I guess I get it as I, okay, and we get it. He mentions bread, and it's kind of like a, sorry for the reference, it's a Homer Simpson moment. He says bread, and they go, mm, bread. Right? He's just thinking about, they're thinking about the wrong things. And Jesus, aware of this, says to them, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? He's frustrated. Listen to what else he says. Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Uh, this takes us again back to Pharaoh. Pharaoh is the one we saw over and over of a hardened heart. Having eyes do you not see, ears do you not hear, and do you not remember? I, when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, and how many baskets of broken pieces did you take up? They said 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said seven. And he said to them, do you not understand? Jesus is frustrated, he's done so much, and his disciples who have been with him every step of the way should have gotten it and understood, but they don't. He continues to do his work. We see him heal the blind man at Bethsaida, and finally at 27, we're going to get kind of this change in what's going on here. Finally, Peter, at least on some level, gets it. Verse 27 uh, and 28, he says, who do, you, who do the people say I am? Some think you're John the Baptist, others Elijah. But then Jesus asks Peter, who do you say that I am? And what does Peter answer? You are the, you're the Christ. So the first time that they begin to see a glimmer of hope, that they start to understand who Jesus is. He's not just a teacher. And Christ, by the way, we have to understand, is not just Jesus' last name. We kind of think about last name, Jesus Christ. That's, that's not what that means. Jesus the Christ is Jesus the Messiah. He is the anointed one, the chosen one of God. And, and we think, okay, good, finally Peter has it, all right? Verse 31, though, he begins to teach them what this means. Okay, Peter says you are the Christ, and he, Jesus is going to begin to reveal to them what that's, going to ha what, what that's going to entail. Verse 31, and this is the reading you heard. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And what is Peter's reaction to this? What does he do to Jesus? Remember the word? Well, it's in, it's in your reading there. He rebukes him. Can you imagine? He just confessed that you're the Messiah. You tell him what that means, and you start to rebuke him. Peter, uh, it, it's amazing, right, what Peter does there. So he rebukes Jesus, and Jesus doesn't take it lying down, right? He turns around, and he's, what does he call Peter? Satan. Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Why? He says, because you don't have the things of God in mind, but the things of men. And then he gives this verse to us that we're going to focus on a little bit more tonight. If anyone would come after me, if you would follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. What I want to finish out with and discuss here as we, as we wrap up Peter confesses Jesus as the Christ, and he starts to tell Peter what that means, that the Son of Man is going to suffer and die. What does it mean to carry your cross and to follow Jesus? 
right? We've talked about that. Our mission statement is we want that Emmanuel exists to be a, courage, a, a diverse community of courageous Jesus, what? Followers. If you're going to take up your, if you're going to follow him, you take up your cross and follow him. What does that mean to be a follower of Jesus? Now, depending on what church you go to, and this is where I will get a little more pointed, there are churches out there that will teach that being a Christian means that everything's going to be pretty awesome in your life, right? You've heard of things about prosperity gospel, for example, and they will teach that if you follow Jesus and you believe it enough, he is going to just fill your life with all sorts of blessings. And, and it's not that that's not true about filling your life with blessings, but what kind of blessings are they talking about? Materialistic blessings. And if you don't have the things you want in your life, you just don't believe enough. And so let me just be quite clear that that theology and that teaching is garbage. Because it starts to, well, just imagine any of us who are struggling in this life. And if you're told that if you believe in Jesus enough, everything's going to be okay, what does that do to your faith? Because you're, you are struggling and you've been told that if you believe enough, you're gonna be awesome and everything's going to be awesome, but your life isn't awesome, so what, do, what must that mean based on those teachings? You ain't, you ain't got enough faith. You're not a good enough Christian. That's bad. That's not what Jesus says at all. Matter of fact, it's completely counter to what Jesus says. He says, if you follow me, you must take up your cross. And let me, let me ask you this. When you think of the cross, aside from our salvation... What does it represent? Sacrifice. The sacrifice. When you think of Jesus, because he says take up your cross. So when you think of Jesus and his cross, what was the experience of Jesus on his cross? Yeah. Death. Death. Suffering, right? I think of the hymn, uh, the emblem of suffering and shame. When Jesus says, take up your cross if you're going to follow me, it does not mean your life is going to always be awesome. Matter of fact, it tells you that life as a follower of Jesus will often be difficult. And so I share that especially today, and I think we begin to understand this a little bit more in the world we live in where we begin to, we've begun to feel a little more pressure from people about being Christian, right? You have your Christian beliefs, well, we get pressured this way and that way, and Jesus kind of is saying in this, yep. We should expect that. Because our, our expectation is to resist that, perhaps like Peter does. What does Peter do in the garden when Jesus is attacked or arrested, not attacked, but what does Peter do in his reaction? He pulls out the sword and he's ready to fight. Jesus says, says that's not what we're about. You pick up your cross and you follow me and your life will be marked by suffering. Now, I'm really selling Christianity at this point, aren't I? You can't wait to be part of this, right? But let's go look at something. I, 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 I liked the first hymn we sang tonight. Verse 2, I'm going to reread. Let us ever walk with Jesus. Uh, so verse 2, let us suffer here with Jesus and with patience bear our cross. Right? You, hear this, you hear the verse in there about bearing your cross. Joy will follow all our sadness. Where he is, there is no loss. Though today, we, though today we sow no laughter, we shall reap celestial joy. All discomforts that annoy shall give way to mirth hereafter. Jesus, here I share your woe. Help me there your joy to know. It does not mean that every moment... Of, oh, see, nice. Good job person upstairs. I, don't, I can't tell if that's Katie or not, but thank you. I was thinking of it, but I didn't want to put any pressure on them. See, joy, right, joy right now with that happening. Thank you. Um, it's not saying that things are going to be bad all the time, but Jesus does say that following him will be marked with difficulties. And I, I share that not to bring you down, but to say that just like we go back to that story of Peter, of, of uh, Jesus uh, and the disciples struggling, are you alone on that journey? Not at all. Matter of fact, it is Jesus that leads us, and he's the one that hops in the boat with you and walks with you when you have struggles. And Jesus is the one that led that, and 
And above all that, as Jesus picked up his cross, he did it perfectly. We will not pick up our crosses perfectly. There will be times we fail to follow him the way he calls us to. There will be times uh, when we put our cross down because, you know what, I don't like this thing. I don't like the suffering that I'm dealing with. I don't like the trouble that's going on in my life because I'm a follower. Maybe, and maybe that just looks like being quiet when you should be more vocal. I, I don't know. There's all sorts of ways that can happen. But follow all of our failures of carrying the cross properly as we follow Jesus. We understand that he carried it perfectly. And that as Jesus carried his cross perfectly, it gives you life. So what does it mean to follow Jesus? It, it will mean some struggles in this life. But it does mean, above all else, eternal life with him. So have confidence in that. Be encouraged that regardless of the struggles here, Jesus knew that. And that's why he went to the cross, so that the life here would not be the end of the story, but that he would bring you to life with him. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding may keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus from now to life everlasting. Amen.